So you have to be able to show where you came from and show the lineage yep. coming forward. So it's the same way with like Daughters of the American Revolution. You actually have to show name states, birth certificates, everything. Can't just say here's the DNA. You can't just say here's the DNA. Look, I'm related to this person, and I have enough to track back to it. So, like, well, you have no connection with us. You don't talk to them or their family, so we don't need you. Correct. Yeah. Well, and and by and large, that's understandable yeah. with the community, right? Yeah. They don't necessarily want people who aren't really a part of their community to come in and and say, "Gee, I should get part of." Especially for the ones that have started casinos, they've had a real problem with it. Oh yeah, because they'll come in because most of those people who are members of those tribes, because we lived in California, which was one of the first places that did it, but they're really, really strict on what you have to do to be able to get entry into the tribes. All right. There was a big, uh, like a whole like little mini like or village it was all casinos in Colorado mm -hmm. that I went to mm -hmm. all Native American owned it's very cool not not mean to be rude but it's already 10 minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, okay all right you want. I'm gonna be able to share screen mm -hmm. all right I can't get the whiteboard to come up every time I bring up the whiteboard now if I bring up this way mm -hmm. it won't let me about if you said frozen. Oh, you're doing this now. But it doesn't carry over. I mean, yeah, because I get someone who can't come in. Their grandfather passed. And I tried recording the other day, and every time I tried to record it, it wouldn't record. It closed the thing down. Now, right now, it's worth seeming to be working. It does seem to be working. But no, that's every, because I'm standing. That's it. So sure, that's a come here for a minute. Now it's working in reverse. You realize that. It's this room, period. Okay. She used to walk in here and I'd be teaching and I'd be like, none of this will turn on. She would literally stand in the doorway and it would all just come on all of a sudden just turn on. It would be halfway through my class. And I'd go to push a button. My students would be like, wait, they're turning on. <laughs> and they did. It was hilarious. So I always said that Jackie had the magic. Touch. No, it's it's reverse. You guys said, no, come here. Come here. Because it's like, yeah, that's it. We'll have to tell. Um, you don't want to know what just happened. Did it just crash? It just went blank. Go stand back over there. It just likes me. I have it. There it goes. It came back on the second she walked toward you. <laughs> it's okay. You can work for her, too. You can. You can do a little thing. The other day, I had to make the student to log me have in because... You, have you been yelling at it? No. That's I've been nice yelling at Canvas. One. Because it would not... It kept telling me I didn't exist in Canvas the other day, but yet I came... Came from my office and logged in. I logged in that morning. Something. And I'm like, I know I just logged off over there. I know I know how to get into Canvas. Can we get in? So, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> No matter what it did, the, no matter what it did the other day, I, I really think it is because remember this is also the room that the table flipped. For you, I have had no problem at all. That's the table that flipped. Yeah, I know. But yeah. I had chocolate pie. The only thing was on it was chocolate pie. Well, they don't like chocolate pie. It likes like one of the baby. And nobody was sitting there. <laughs> There, there, and there. Mm, nobody else. All right. Have fun, guys. See you, Katie. Have a good day. Bye. I'm not closing it all the way. I say, if it can flip tables and mess over stuff, why can't it like vacuum and do some laundry? <laughs> but it no, it's not cast with the front of the ghost. Mm -hmm. Not one of these bone pies. <laughs> so, now, so, yeah, I, I literally had to tell housekeeping how my students were having a pie fight, and they're like, what? It was pie day, and next thing I know, they're throwing pies at each other. And that sounds like a good excuse to me to say that the table arbitrarily burned. Don't you think? It sounds like a better excuse. Every time it's a pie day, I always think it's being interesting. Pie. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, That's what I want to have with you. Yes. 
8.1, we're going to actually start talking about sampling. You know, I might be better if I use the pen instead of the mouse. So let's try that. So we have a population. And we can't pull the population, right? But the problem is, up until now, I keep telling you about the population mean standard deviation, correct? Well, how in the heck do I get it if I can't pull the population? Well, what I can do is run a sample. And that sample, since I run the sample and I can pull the whole sample, I can find the mean and the standard deviation. Then I can run another sample. And that next sample, I can pull the mean. And I can run another sample, and I'm going to pull the mean. And I'm going to run another sample, and I'm going to pull the mean. And another one, 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 right? But you're starting to see what's happening, right? I mean, all these samples, and each sample comes with its own mean. Well, what happens is then I can run the mean of the means. And that's what that means. And what I have found, what we have found, it's not what I've found, the mean of the means is the population mean. And it's because we have multiple means now going. So this is how. We could tell you, hmm? I sure am. I'm glad you said that. Well, I'm not on the document camera. I say I'd hit that button. I'm like, so yeah, the, the, the big black circle is the population. So I was, yeah. We'll just do this, back it up. So there's our big old population. Since I can't find the mean of it, this is what I was talking about. I pulled a population, I pulled a sample mean and the little sample mean, the sample has its own mean. I can calculate that. I pull another sample and another sample and another and each one of those, I can calculate the mean. And they start to overlap. So all of a sudden, I have enough of them that I can pinpoint the population mean. This is how come we can say, hey, we've got the population mean now. This is new, isn't it? Yeah, because I haven't really heard you say too much about population. Everything is in samples. And this is the reason why we do all the samples. It's because what I can't pull the entire population on stuff. I can't. One, it's either it's an impossibility to pull the entire world, or two, how much would it cost? So there's multiple reasons why we can't pull the entire population. But yet, as I said, I keep telling you guys, um, we have a population mean. Here's the population mean. Here's No one's wa wondered, how did we get it? Because we've ran multiple samples upon multiple samples. You guys actually help is, helped, all the, student, all the statistics students helped. Because think back to the M&Ms each one of you guys had M&Ms, right? Each one of those little pack of M&Ms or that cup of M&Ms turned into what? A sampling of all the M&Ms 
or the population of M&Ms? Someone keeps looking in the window. <laughs> So, if I can't calculate the population mean without doing a bunch of samples, that must mean that there is a I don't, know, I don't want to use that symbol. Must mean that there is a standard deviation of the samples also. Now, what's that, Jackie? What? That thingy right there. This one? That's the omega. That's this. It looks, it looks different. What's up? Is she here? She, uh, she's here, but she just headed back that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're fine. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's the omega symbol. It's um for the population standard deviation. The only thing I've added to it was the X bar, and the X bar stands for the sample mean. Now, if I calculate have to calculate from the samples to get the population mean, I have to now recalculate. And here's the formula. Now, we don't actually call this the standard deviation of the means. But get, understand, it really, that's what it is. It is the standard deviation of the means. What do we call it? But please understand, we may call it the standard error of means, but how does it behave? The exact same way a standard deviation does. It's how much wiggle room we have around our means. How much room of error? Because remember, it's the deviations that we, it's the space from the mean. Well, that's with the standard of errors. It's, it is a standard deviation, but it's the standard deviation of all the means together. Mm -hmm. But this is now based on taking the samplings, all the samplings together and recalculating the standard deviation. Now, the formula is not written that way, but I'm going to show you why is that we do this? Why do we have this formula? You're going to see that here in a little bit. Now, we do have two criteria. Two criteria that have to be met. One. I don't want that fat line. One. Okay, why are you doing this? Our sampling has to be random. Two. N has to be less than 5% of the population. If you're looking at the notes I handed out, what I basically just walked through was the entire front page. Look at the lovely little banner thing down there. That little banner thing, I've, I've been slowly taking Pearson's notes that we're supposed to be using and tearing them apart and recreating them. That little banner and those two little quick little quotes, yeah, they used to be more than a paragraph a piece. So I'm like, why, why do I need an entire paragraph to tell you guys it, that you have to take your sampling via randomness, take, take them random. And I'm pretty sure that when you guys opened the M&Ms, there was nobody in the factory that was sitting there saying, okay, I wanna pull four green ones, two blue, 
No, it was what? It come down a chute, went into the little bags, and they sealed the bags, right? And it was done by weight. And I just walked into the store, picked up some bag and bottle, and then did I say, this bag looks like it belongs to you, and this little bag look No, it was just like, here, have one. Flipped them out, right? Everything was as about as random as you can get. I had absolutely no control how those bags went from the factory to you. Except for the fact I opened it and here you go. So that was a pure random thing. And I'm pretty sure that that little bag of M&Ms, do I know how many total M&Ms they've made? No. So there's gonna be times in our studies I can't tell you the exact size of the population. I can't. Like I said, do I know how many M&Ms they've made? No idea. But I'm pretty sure that that little fun size pack was less than 5% of all the ones they've made. Pretty sure. So there's times when we have to, when we go to make sure that these criteria are made or met, that we're going to be like making the, as I put it, pretty good assumptions that we've met that, that less than 5%. Pretty sure. So I'm pretty sure a fun size pack of five of 15, 20 M&Ms is less than 5% of all the M&Ms they've made. Pretty sure. All right, yes. Okay. So you're, so you're gonna get population, population studies, right? Uh -huh. So are we understanding a population through sample as well and say color? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because most, as I said, not over time, can we sit there and truly look at the true population? So we're going to look at the true population from this chunk of random samples and this chunk of random samples and this chunk of random samples and looking at how they all share the same and we get towards the true population characteristics. So that's what I said. There's... A statistic, the statistic goes with the sample as a parameter goes with a population, but they're both pretty much the same thing. So like in the graph that you provided you before, the sample will have a high mean compared to a population where it's peaked out because that sample has less data in it where it's going to have more capacity. Yes. All right. So now let's look at the next page. Let me just kind of paste through some of this. And it's all based off of this theory that I just talked about. So we got two sets of studies right at the moment. And I need to know if one of my samplings is good or both my samplings are good or are they both bad? Because I have a population of something that's 500. And my first sampling, I pull 50 people. So my little n is 50. What is 5% of 500? That's when you go 500 times 0.05. It shouldn't be equals, it should be less than. So what is 5% of 500? 25? Huh? 25. 5% <laughs> of 500 is 25. So does my first sampling of 50 people meet the criteria? because my sample size is not less than 5% of the population. Uh, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah, this is, yeah. 
that's not it's not a usable sample not usable sample all right so now that i've sit there and kind of blew my first set of sampling i've got my still same 500 people and i go back and i pull another set of samples this time I only pulled 20 out of the 500 whatevers. So again, I'm gonna run my test and it was randomly pulled. Does 20 work and meet both those criteria? So 20 against 5% of a population of 500, which is 25. So is, and I keep putting equals. So is 20 less than 25? Yes. So my second set of samples is a good sample set. All right. So just getting you guys into the feel of it, because the first thing we get to find out is whether or not our sample meets our criteria where I can say, yeah, I can do this. All right. So example two, I'm just walking into this, getting you guys used to this idea. I want to calculate the mean. I want to calculate the mean of the means and the standard deviation of the means. If my mu is 100, what's my mean of means? Well, remember I said, I said the mean of means equals the mean, right? So my mean of means is very easy to calculate. 100. All right, now this is the one that I actually have to calculate because what was the formula? The population standard deviation of the square root of my sample. Well, my standard deviation is 18 and the square root of 16, I'm just plugging into the formula and doing the math. What's square root of 16? It's four, so 18 divided by four is? Look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> no, no, I already wrote it. Population standard is the standard Correct. All right. So I said so this first first couple things, just getting you guys used to the. The, these new ideas. That's all it is. So let's actually look at applying. All right. Because the whole purpose of statistics is using it. All right. So we have trunk length of female elephants. Okay. And we have a mean length of 168. Well, no, not yet. Well, actually, no, because I'm giving it to you. And we have a standard deviation of 11.5. Now, I want you to look closely at the next two problems. Because on one of these problems, I ask you 
both of them asking about probability, but the first one I'm saying, what's the probability of randomly selected elephant having a trunk length of less than 144? Well, that'd be P of X less than or equal to, you just put less than 144. This is what you guys were doing back in seven. So that means I'm going to go to stack crunch. So we have stat, calculator, normal. It's what we've been doing. But we have a mean of 168, standard deviation of 11.5, and I'm asked about 144. Now you notice I did not recalculate. Not. So, so I don't lose the numbers as we run them. So to have a trunk length less than 144 centimeters, it's a probability of what? 0 0.0. It's close enough because it'd be point, uh, be 1.8%. All right. Look at that. Did I mention anything in that question about sampling? No. no. That question is random sample. This is because this is in this in this section. This is where students start to get so confused. I don't know when to recalculate when I'm not. Look at the question. Pay attention to how the question is worded. The first one says nothing about sampling. So you're going to use the mean and the standard deviation like it states. And soon they're talking about the population. But let's see what happens if I take out all these elephants, I pull nine elephants. I'm pretty sure that nine elephants meets the criteria. Don't you think of being less than 5% of all elephants? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Why is everything like when we do all these things, like the last assignment we done in this one, why is it like 0 0.5? 0 0.05? Yeah, what, 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 what's up with that number? Anybody else want to explain with? Because I already talked about it. Okay. Oh, but it matches to something else that we're heading towards. Huh? Yes, that's what I was waiting for. She 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 remembers it. What is it? You remember what it said? But why? Why? Where does the 0 0.05 come from? No. I talked about it. what? Hold on from that room. A little bit, a little bit. Keep going, keep that. coming. Well, no, it comes from how much that is shaded is less than the Yeah. Under. Uh, it, it's, Under. It, it goes hand in hand with something because I it's, talked about it. It's huh? under it's probability still. still. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Con, 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 con. Right, I'm not going to say it until you guys. Confidence. Confidence yeah. interval. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
And we are typically 95% confident. So for 95% confident to be unusual, we're outside our 95% confidence interval. So there's where the 5% comes from. Yeah, I was like, come on, keep coming, keep coming. Right, so, like, come on. so under five, not usual, over five, usual. Yeah, because we're now in, if you're over 5%, you're into the confidence interval. They go hand in hand. Confidence interval of 95% is going to generate a 5% that's unusual. But do we want a 95% confidence interval on stuff like medicine? No. That's when that 5% changes. That's what I was talking about. 5% is our rule of thumb, but is it always? And the answer is no. no. We want tighter controls on medical stuff. So a lot of times we crank that down, depending on what it is, to 97.5%. So if I have a 97.5% confidence interval, what would be unusual? 2.5%. I think this is why she misses stuff. She's over here asking questions. <laughs> Sorry, because I, okay. I keep trying to catch up. Like, Y'all get on something else, and then I ain't even got the other part. No, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to answer your question. Well, not like trash. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Because I said, why, why is it not always, we don't always have the 95% confidence interval because when it comes to medical, do we want 95% confidence or do we want it tighter? Tighter. Want it tighter. So then that's when we switch to 97.5%. Is that that thing? Mm, it's kind of a it's, that's an empirical most what you're thinking. I mean, yeah. how's that uh, now? Okay, ninety-seven point five percent. We start to kick into the medical. So if I have a ninety-seven point five percent confidence interval, what would be unusual? Well, if ninety-five and five go together, what do you think goes with ninety-seven point five? Two point five. What are you that number? One hundred percent. Oh, okay. minus ninety-seven point five is. So we'd be unusual if we were less than 2.5%. Now, certain things, we crank it all the way down. When we crank it all the way down, that's when we go all the way down to a 99% confidence interval. And if I have a 99% confidence interval, what would be my unusual? What would it be? If I crank it all the way down to a 99% confidence interval, what would be my unusual? One percent. That's where that odd, that that alpha, that five percent comes from. Is because majority of the time we deal with a ninety-five percent confidence interval, and up until when we we finally hit the Z alpha bit, that's when I finally introduced. Why do we have a five percent? It's because it goes hand in hand with the confidence intervals. Things are starting to do this. They're all coming together now. Things are starting to come together. So it's like, I, I just introduced, and I'm not, it's like at that time, I'm not going to confuse you yet. Just understand 5% is the rule. 5%. That's not a guarantee. It, why isn't it? It's because it comes down to what are we doing? Now, personally, would we ever really truly want to use like an 80% confidence interval? Yeah, wow, scary. I've actually seen an 80% confidence interval. And it was a very weak study, but it was also over something that was like, eh, okay, whatever. If you really wish your time on that, that type of. 90% yeah. is pushing it. Again, a 90% confidence there will be like, I'm 90% confidence that Eminem's lied. Something that's, that's, better. that's trivial. Yeah. yeah. I'm, like, I'm 90% sure that, that drink you're drinking won't poison you. <laughs> that's you're getting the idea so it's like 95 percent allows for some room of error uh and things like that i said but when we start really cranking it down that's when we're starting to really truly actually talk about medical yes Honestly, yes leukemia study um you don't want the the, the stuff that we're some of the stuff we're doing down at uc do you really want to take it check into a kid's life on less than 99% confident? Is she raw for real? That's crazy. I they pay you what you work. I get paid dinner. <laughs> it is. 
I get paid dinner. I do it for a friend who's doing the research, but I told him, I said, if he ever goes to uh, publication, my name had better be on that publication. So, my name had better be on that publication. So, all right. So, see what happens now on the on part B. I talked about the population and the percentage. Now I'm going to start to like do the sampling bit. So let's see what happens when I have a sample size of nine. Now that means my mean is going to stay the same, but it's my omega x or my sampling of standard deviation. I've got to recalculate. And that's when I take the 11.5 and divide by the square root of nine. Three point three three two. Yeah. What's eleven point five divided by nine? Eight three. I'm like I'm like my I'm subtracting. I'm not saying thing. That doesn't sound like this. Like am I subtracting wrong? Square root of nine. Eleven point five. So my new standard deviation is three point. Eight, three. Now, remember I spent back on, what was it, seven, one, I talked about what happens the smaller my standard deviation gets, what happens to the bell curve? It gets bigger. Yeah, it's it's taller. Taller. Gets taller, but, because I talked about widening the curve. What happens when we widen the curve or flatten the curve? It's when we start to spread it out. It's the same amount of data. She said now Right. Yeah. That was when she talked about the curve. Yes. Okay. I always say the curve. But but look at that. All we did was do a sample size of nine and look at the number we got. What? Oh, okay. mm -mm. It's in what? Scientific notation. It's in scientific notation. That means there is nine zeros in front. So, so that means you gotta go back, you gotta go to the left nine times, right? So yeah, but I'm just putting the number that how do we normally write? I talked about that already because I put zero, eight, zero, or nine zeros in front of that. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, eight. How close to zero is that? But do I still say it's a zero? No, no, that's when I do the he is really less than 0 0.00. I'm going to throw in an extra zero just because of how many zeros there is. Yeah. I'm still not going to say it's zero. All right. Okay, so I have another one. Uh-huh. I know you just said it, but I still don't know the name. That big thing right there. Mega. So that stands for, that means you look for the population. That means it's the standard deviation of the samples, which is the calculated standard deviation of the population. Standard. Yeah. But that's the reason why we put that X bar there. Its true name is called the standard error of the mean. Okay. But what does it act like? It acts like the standard deviation of all the sample means. Remember when I drew all those little circles? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I got the mean from all the mean means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, there's an error that goes with that, which I acts wrong. just how much wiggle room we have around it. So that's what that is. It's how much you think we could potentially be off around that population that we just recalculate from all these samplings. But how does it behave? It behaves just like a standard deviation. So looking at the next one, I went from the population. Now I went to a sampling of nine. Let's see what happens when I do a sampling of 12. 
Okay, so this this first green one, oh, this don't go. So this is the old joint with the square root there. It's part of the, uh, what's the name, what I'm looking for? Equation? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So what is 11.5 divided by square root of 12? That one you got to keep because I can't do square root of 12 quickly in my head. So that's my new standard deviation. Bring back in here, plug in. Let's see what the probability happens. Eleven of them now. Eleven go in front. So this is two point four times ten to the negative thirteenth, which the probability we still just turn right around and say. But each time I keep taking a little bit larger sampling. What is happening to the, how close are we getting to being dead on? Very close. Yeah, I mean, that that's, I can keep, I can do another. Let's see what happens if I, this is not on the sheet. What happens if I do a sample size 20? Square root of 20, what we get? 2.57. I'm going to change that to 2.57. All right, Ray, see this new probability? Just picked up eight more samples. Now I get 20 zeros in front of that four. I, I can't, I mean, I can just keep cranking closer and closer and closer to zero as you want, but I'm doing it by doing samplings of the population. All right. So this is you're kind of seeing it. So what do you guys think? Then because question D on the next page is what effect does increasing a sample size have on the probability? Um. It lowers the probability. Yep. We're becoming closer to being exact. It lowers, it decreases the probability. So we're getting almost dead on. Oh, yeah, because it's. You get more uh, like exact numbers when you use the population. So we want to get a like, piece of the sample. So the more samples you get, the better the numbers, right? Yep. So a lot of large numbers coming into effect. Couldn't that also be reversed, though? Because I like if you have a bigger population, I guess I feel like if you're looking at it from like a medical standpoint, and like say they've done like 500 surgeries and like 450 of them have been successful. Like, couldn't it be higher or lower the probability depending? Low well, large in numbers. Low well, large numbers, the more accurate data you can, it evens out. And that's what's happening. It's what you're witnessing. I guess I was just thinking about it. It's like, if you have more positive outcomes, it's going to make like the positive probability higher. It just it becomes closer and closer to being the exact. Yes. So you're seeing witnessing what the, the law of large numbers is really you're starting to see how this the effects of the law of large numbers. All right. Now I just mentioned the law of large numbers, but I'm also now going to mention the next big theorem. That is the central limit theorem. And I hate to do this, but I'm going to show how the central limit theorem plays out with the with diagrams. It's about the easiest way I know how to string it students see it. Because before, what did I say? 
We can't do a whole lot if what? Our data is not evenly distributed, right? Right. All right. Bottom of page three. We have a population that is not normally distributed. I can say it's downright skewed, right? Hmm. But I'm still going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation because here's why. If I run a sample, this is just a sample in the port. Look what happens to my histogram. Still skewed, right? Hmm. But it moved. All right, so I'm going to increase my sample size. And what happened to my histogram? We're not able. It moved again, right? Because understand, we went from something that was horribly skewed. Now I'm now starting to run samplings, and lo and behold, look what happened. It's moved. It's almost normal, correct? So let me take a bigger sample. It's still not normal, but it's darn near close, isn't it? Yeah, the third one is, so what do we do? So this is the other reason why we can run samplings. Okay, so when we run samplings, we have discovered, this is what the central limit theorem states. If we have, Data that is not normally distributed, skewed. Or what if we can't tell because we can't get a hold of the whole population? We have an unknown population. So if we have an unknown population, can I tell you if it's skewed or not? I can't. If it's an unknown population, can I truly tell you how what every single smoker does? Nope. It's an unknown population. So if the sample's below 30, it's not going to be normal. But the ones that if we have skewed data, what we have found in our data, we need to get a sample size of at least 30. And at that point, all of a sudden, our data, our sample has become normal. The normally distributed. This is what the central limit theorem. This is why I said it's easier to kind of see how it changes the histograms. That as we sample a skewed piece of data, and that's a that was a definitely skewed piece of data. I start running samples on it, and all of a sudden <laughs> I'm getting real close to twenty five. I mean to thirty, right? At twenty five, I'm real close, but all of a sudden it's almost normal. What do you think would happen if I did a thirty? It'd be uniform. That's what we've discovered. So then if it's below 30, would you just say whether or not it's skewed up to right? Uh-uh. If it's below 30, we can make an assumption that our population <clears throat> was normally distributed. If it's less than 30. Yep. If you're working for sample size that's less than 30, you can make an assumption that it means the population itself was normally distributed. Because otherwise, we can't do it. We can't run our test. They won't work. Again, population is less than 30. We can determine. No, if our sample Samples. is less than 30, yes. we can make the assumption that our population was normally distributed. That, is, that is what is coming out of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says if you have skewed or unknown data or skewed or unknown population, we need a sample, we need to run our samples of at least 30. And all of a sudden, our, our data is now normally distributed. Those that figured this out, a lot smarter than me. 
less than 30 makes mm -hmm. it to that. If it's less than 30, that means our population itself was already normally distributed. Mm -hmm. If our population is already normally distributed and we start sampling from it, we don't have to have as big of samples. You know, this class will be so bad if they gave you more time to do it. It's like sometimes I be understanding stuff and when you switch on me, I go slowly. Yeah. So it's like, I feel like if it didn't have to be as fast paced, we probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't fail because it's not, it's just new information, but it's- It's a lot of information, back. but it's, yeah. we cut four sections out. Oh? We cut yeah. four sections out. Oh, did you serious? We cut all six. We cut all six and, um, because we, since we cut six, we could cut two sections of five. Yeah, I feel like the class needs to be doubled. You need to buy some time on the tougher stuff. Why don't they double it? Because State of Ohio says this is the amount of electric time you get for this many credit hours. It's so they increase the credit hours. If you increase the credit hours, they have set forth, and it comes from your four year colleges and such, too, that you will cover X amount of material. So you get more material if you have longer hours. So is this fair? What? It's, it's the agreement that all state colleges have met, went into. Because otherwise, the the to get your accreditations to move from a two year college to a four year college. So I'm asking question. Do you personally think that this is enough time for us to learn all of the information? Some classes, yes. Some classes, no. That is fair. I can. I mean, it's not to be mean. My high schoolers, in this case, same 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 thing. We can breeze right through it. Yeah. But again, for them to be in high school and in college, what type of students do we got? The cream of the crop. Yes. yes okay. Four year colleges, they have an entrance where you've got to score so high to be able to get in and be accepted in. Um, okay. All right. Two year college, it's not to downplay because. Guess what? Where do I work? I work at a two-year college, and I really feel that we feel a need. The problem is a two-year college, and this is where the agreements, four-year colleges would never used to accept anything coming from a two-year college. Why? Because they said we weren't meeting the quality or the, we weren't passing the smell test, Yeah, that we were watering stuff down. And some colleges, yeah, they weren't. Other colleges, right on board, right on track. So... They went in and they said, you will cover X amount of material. And once we agree, well, we can hit it within a certain percentage. Okay. By cutting four sections to buy you guys, to buy you guys more time. So it's kind of like, like this class, this, not just this class, but anyone. That Any requires. class. It's like you reprogramming somebody. <laughs> You're right. I'm serious. Like so, we we basically gearing you up, and to get so it's like you don't want to waste your time here. If uh, the four year colleges weren't going to accept it, right? Yeah. So I mean, for the four year colleges, it's tougher than this. It can be, and most of your four year press professors they have TAs and such that you can go spend hours with outside of class. Oh, who's the TA? So teacher TA assistant. assistant. So, bye. I keep moving. Okay, I'm right. sorry. That's okay. But this this box here, this is basically what I just went through and explained and showed you. Yep. Is that the population shape center of spread of population? If it is normally, we can do this. If it is not normal, we can do this. But right here, what did I just say? If the distribution is unknown or not normal, then the distribution of the sample mean becomes approximately normal when we have a sample size greater than 30. That's where I made the statement of N is greater than 30. It's for when you're not normal or when you don't know. If I have a sample size that's less than 30, then that means I know that my population is normally distributed. Now, 
looking at this, I wrote on this earlier. Can you guys tell me what my mean is by looking at my bell curve? 79. 79. 79. And the mean's the mean, right? Yeah. Yep. So what would be my sampling of the standard deviation? Three. Three. And you got it by? Three. Subtraction Three. from here to here. 89, All right. 82 minus 79. Okay. All right. So just to drive home, what assumption can I make if I can work with a sample size of 16? That it's going to be less than 30 is a population function. She's got it. Well, she said, I did write it down once. <laughs> uh, less than 30 population is normally distributed. Okay. That will be because I have a sample size of 16. Since I'm working with a sample size of 16, I can assume that my population is. Oh, hmm? Sorry, I heard that word. <laughs> If I miss that on the so, exam, it smacked me. So do you guys know this right here? Not yet. Yes, I said not yet. Right now, I'm just asking, what assumption can I make? The population should be the same. Yep. Question. Yes. Why is it, so is it because the bell curve is already uniform? Is that why it's normally uniform? Yes, that's, that's the whole reason why that shapes the way it is. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, that's because, that's because, that's because, that's because that's it's not skewed data originally. Right. If it was skewed data, then it would take you at a tilt 30 or greater to get that. Got it. So, all right. So, now here's my next question, and I can't show it on the camera. Why do we worry about this? Because up until now, the question is if I have a sample size of 16, what is the standard deviation of population? This is how we calculate the population, standard deviation. We actually use this, this formula backwards. We've ran sample, 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 sample. We get all these. So now I can go backwards. Yeah. Ah, here we go. So if I have a sample size, is this for, for yeah, it's the next back page, part B. So if I have a sample size at 16 and I don't know my population standard deviation, but because of multiple tests, I know this guy, can I not calculate and find the true population standard deviation? Yes. yes. So if my, from my bell curve, you guys just told me what? My, Standard deviation was three, three, and I'm doing a sample size of 16. So in other words, if I knew all, if I can do this, I can now calculate my population standard deviation by going backwards. What's square root of 16? Four. How do I get rid of something off the bottom of a fraction? It's four. So the population standard deviation for this study is 12. Come on, from this over here? Yep. I went backwards. For part B. All right. Okay. Sample five. Well, let's, let's think this through now. And and actually put some of the stuff together now. I put all these little bitty pieces. It makes sense, it's just fast. I have female to college students, they're 18 to 24, and I know that the data is skewed right. However, I calculated the mean of 168 and the height of 11.5, I kept it normal. I mean, the numbers just to keep it easy on you guys. Tell me what I need to, to be able to compare, to compute probabilities. What do I need to know? Three things. Um, what about, no, I, I've got the mean, I got the standard deviation. There, there are three, these some, 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 some first thing about. There's some assumptions like I did before I could even do anything. Yeah. 
He's got one, but I'll give you stuff before that. Look back at the front page. So no, I got to pull a random sample. Five point zero five. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so my sample now has to be bigger than thirty, but less than five percent of the population of females. And I'm going to know that I have to gather it randomly. So you guys said, let's put this all together now. So in other words, I'm going to write, sometimes I'm walking a tight rope on my sampling because if it has to be bigger than 30 because my population is skewed or I don't know it, but yet it's got to be less than 5% of the population. Can you see where sometimes we start to get a narrow window on the size of our population? Potentially? Yeah. So there's times we got to kind of like really stop and think about how many people am I going to pull? Because I got a window, All right? So let's put this into action. I want to run a probability that a random sample of 40 female college students will result in a mean height of less than 163. My first question is, can I do it? Well, it says they're pulling a random sample, so that one's met. And 40 is greater than 30, right? But is it less than 5% of the population? Yeah. Yes. I heard some people say yeah, and some people say no. You know how you check? You say 40 is what? It's 40 less than 5% of the population. How many 18 to 24? Of 18 to 24 college students. Here's how you can check. I've got 40 as my sample size. Okay, but the first part was just saying, what do we need to do now? We're going to put it into effect. Well, my sample size is 40. And I got 5% of the population. And I need to be less than 5% of the population. What is 5? How do, how do I solve for N? Divide. Divide. By? Yeah, zero. Divide both sides by 0 0.05. And tell me what size population? 800. 800. Now, remember I said there's times I have to stop and think, does it make sense that there's more than 800 female college students in the United States that are age 18 to 24? Yes. I can't tell you how many there is, but I can pretty much safely assume, and that's how we check. We literally do check. Well, is it? Is it going to be okay? I go backwards. I pick a sample size, I go backwards and look at that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's more than 800. That's what you call your educated guesses. That's the, that's the so yeah, I'm pretty sure there's more than 800, all right? So then now that I've decided that, I need to recalculate my standard deviation. And how do I recalculate that standard deviation? Uh-uh. I've already given it. So, um, both in divided yeah. by oh, the yeah. square root Sorry. of n. Yep. Which is 1.818. So now I have a mean and a standard deviation to go back to my calculator. And what was my question? Less than 163. Is it unusual to find a female college student that is shorter than 163 centimeters? Because what I just did is I took information from a sample of 40, calculated a probability, 
And then what did you catch what I said? Is it unusual to find a female college student? And stay for my sample of 40. I took information that I knew from my sample and made a statement about a population. And that's what we do. We did all this tonight today, just so you understood the process of how I can take a sample and then now I can start making declarations against the population. Because my last one, yeah, I, I can state that it's, it's unusual to find, state that way, at 0 0.029 or 0 0.03, point, yeah, 0.3 percent, it is unusual to find a female college student ages 18 to 24 who is shorter than 168 centimeters based on me polling 40 people. How we feel? Not too bad. Very Not too bad. It is a process. It is a process. You're right. But it, there's a lot of little things we have to meet before we can start the full process. This isn't the full process yet. Of course not. This is a this is a good chunk. It's it's starting to be a good chunk. Because now you're seeing the well, one now I can take samplings and I can make statements against population and such. No, you need to leave early. I'm sorry. I, I said you could go. <laughs> yeah. All right. We feeling all right. Yes, it's unusual to find a female college student that is less than 168 centimeters in height. Yep. That that's your interpretation stuff kicking in, but I did it based on my sample. Story of numbers. Yeah, my story of numbers, but it was based on my sample. But I made a statement about a population based on. Sampling data. I just want to make sure I wrote a balance one. Okay. How are we feeling? It's like I picked up half of it, but then I have to go to the tutor to get the rest. I'm feeling decent. Yeah. I just need to work on it. It's all right. But yeah, I mean, different classes, different paces. The uh, one thing on Tuesdays and Thursdays that they've got you guys beat is the uh, the plus class. When you said, is there yes. okay, the plus class? Mm -hmm. The plus class. At a certain point, mm -hmm. and they just now hit that point, is that they are a five credit hour class. So they fast. They have support work that goes with it, but they hit a certain point in the semester. This is how what colleges are starting to do is we're we're introducing things called plus classes that. These are students that didn't quite test in or meet the criteria to be in the full college class because they're missing some gaps in their basic knowledge. So we spend the first half of the semester when it's easier patching the gaps. And then after the second half of the semester, my gaps are now filled with the basic math knowledge that they were missing. So now they get that extra hour of time spent on the stats. They pay for five credit hours. How many credit hours is this? So that means they get two hours more a week. But, but the first, first half, they're doing double the work because they're doing. Oh, it makes me think of like how this class is accelerated. It would just look like that and stretch out a long period of time. Yeah, that would suck. So yeah, they got fun, but yeah. So then, at a certain point, that's this is where they. I really like the plus portion because the first part, when it is, you really don't need the extra hour. But now we're getting into this stuff that you guys are starting to feel like, man, she's flying. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of am a little bit. 
but they have a whole nother extra hour. Yeah, yep. I feel like with this one, we could have done more. Just so they decide. It, it's going to keep. So the reason why I came with us not to be mean to you guys, but I gotta go. Yeah, I'm stoned a little bit because we can see if anybody else showed. Mm -hmm. Do you have to go, Jay? No, I was, I was when I was sitting there. Where it was like we're gonna get started. That's a lot of work. To cover. Yeah, I've I've got a lot to cover. I got a lot to cover, and this is the reason why, guys, I don't want to straddle spring break with half of chapter eight before and half of chapter eight after. She sent me all of the notes for Monday. Do you have a printout of it? And so, with you, so I could write it all. I do not, but send me an email, and I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah, she she took like pictures of something else to me, but yeah, it's better if I have it in front of me to write on. Do you have questions about what was covered? No, you answered them with I didn't know um, about the QQ. Yeah. Plot. So QQ plot. plot. Yeah, I didn't know what QQ plot was, so, so I missed uh, like a fraction of two questions. Yeah. That. You missed the horrification. I should put it. I missed the like the questions uh, E and D. Um, the poor, the, the poor prisoners yeah. do not have stack crunch. Yeah. The Hand calculation? Right. I've looked it up. It's it's insane. It is right. insane. Yeah. yeah. The, so it's 26 parts of it. TI 84 part of it? Yeah. It's three pages long of step to step instruction. That's the thing we use in TI 84. You guys, here's download the data. So I challenged my tutor at the, at the prison, who I he is a calculator whiz. And I was talking one day about how you can program the TI 84 because you can do what? It has to follow these oh. And I looked at us. You didn't know you can you can create programs for your TI-84? You showed me that when we were going through the like, yeah. And he goes, no. And I started explaining to him. I said, I have several. And I said, it's not that hard. You just got to stop and think about what it is you want the program to do mathematically. And then you've got to break it down into the pieces and, and break it up. And then there's commands. And I showed him. And he was like, he was like seeing all these commands, and then the lady come back and says, do, do, do you think you can? So we did this. No, he goes, do you, do you think you can get me like a list of the commands? I saw, see what I can do, and I smiled. The next class come, I walked in, and I handed him a packet. How many pages? About like that. And he looked at me, and I said, read the cover. Yeah, and his eyes grew and he just grew. TI manual for programming. Yeah. It was the actual manual for programming. When you buy it. Not now. Oh, it's, it's online. Oh, wow. It came with mine. It's only online now. The full the full packet, full manual is online. And it seriously prints out this size and it's about that thick. See, I bought mine. Well, I, like I said, I have my son has a calculator and I have one. I bought mine for him originally when he was in eighth grade, and he's going to be this. Oh, God, God. So that's why my name. Ray, did you have a I question or? Oh, okay. I just like. Just All right, I'll see you later. Have a good okay. break. Everybody, yeah, definitely that's, have a good break. Sometimes it's just a step away from it. I've had students sit there and send me questions, and then by the time I get to answer it, I look to see because they say I just can't get this work, and I look back and I'm like, okay, I'm assuming you figured it out because you've got the answer correct. This stuff right So this is your check. So this it's getting into where we're getting into the nitty gritty. We're getting into where we're going to actually start. It is, and as I said, but you should see what the poor prisoners got to go through. Because we're still going to have my question for uh, probability. So you're this year. I would look like find this a lot of it. Okay. Okay. Oh, when it like okay. adds to like a percent, I like. Like what is a per, I, I didn't want to talk about it. So what is a percentile? It's a percentage. It's going backwards. If I want something that's the 99th percentile, yeah, that, that means you've already got the percent. So you, it goes in the second box to calculate the X. Yeah, I like just kept, because like the way it, it cannot explain to me, like when I'm like reading like the explanations, it just says the numbers. 
Whatever. Like, yeah. Doesn't tell you. Like, yeah. I like I put random things in and like try to figure out the situation. But yeah, that's one that catches a lot of people. Just realize like, what what is the percent? Well, I did put that in, but I didn't put it in the right spot. And that's point. I put point nine nine like this. So. Yeah. No, it goes into the right box because again, it's a percentage. Well, what's that second box up where it, that's the percentage? So point zero zero two nine. That's a percentage. So when they're telling you what's ninety nine percent, they're giving you this portion. What they're not giving you is the X. Okay. And we're going to look at even that more. Okay. Because like yes, yeah, so now we go. So now we got to go this way. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. You have a good break. Okay. This is this is what we've done all this work to get to this. Oh my God. So that is zero zero two nine. And so basically, when you look at this, because this is because this is less than 2.05, which is 5%, that's what makes it. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem.